So I remind you here in the chapel, you may be seated. <clears throat> this is a small chapel where the Tridentine Mass is offered. The priest will fly in uh, periodically from <clears throat> Kentucky and elsewhere to bring Mass because the Catholic Church is in such a crisis right now that there's very few priests throughout the world who are continuing the traditional Latin Mass. This is the true Catholic Mass that comes right from our Lord, from the Apostles. St. Gregory the Great, already in the 500s, he says uh, this Mass must never change. And he, he defended the Mass, he protected the Mass, he added ten words to the Mass, and it was a huge, almost a war in Rome. So this Mass goes right back to Christ, and in the Council of Trent in 1500s, the Council of Trent uh, canonized this Mass and said, let no one dare, no Pope, no Bishop, no priest, dare to change this Mass. And if they do change this Mass, they will incur the anger of Almighty God and of the Apostles Peter and Paul. So this is why, <clears throat> one of the reasons why we, the priests, faithful to tradition, we continue the tradition of the Church and the traditional Mass. We pray that Pope Francis and these Popes of Vatican II will stop destroying the Church and build her up again the way the popes have always done in the past, up before Pius, from Pius XII and before him. So we are in a grave war, a grave spiritual battle between Christ and Satan. And this is an exciting time to be married. So we're 50 years after Vatican II, which ended in 1965. So we're going on now 51 years after the, one of the greatest disasters in the church history the Second Vatican Council, which changed the Mass into a Protestantized service, facing the people instead of God, a table for a meal instead of the altar of sacrifice, a priest who's a social worker rather than the man who offers the, the sacrifice to God and forgives sins. And they've changed all the sacraments, changed the catechism, changed the churches, changed the prayers, changed everything. It's basically a new conciliar religion, which they themselves have called it, the conciliar church. And that's your local parish, the mass facing the people, alleluia, the ladies singing on the altars, ladies giving communion, and they have no right to touch the blessed sacrament. No hands that are not consecrated are allowed to touch the body and blood of Christ. So this is the crisis we're in, the, the, the battle we're in, because Satan wants to destroy this Mass, destroy the Catholic faith. He has always hated the Catholic Church, and because it's the only church Christ founded. So this is certainly an exciting time for uh, Jake and Anna to be married, for any of us, any of you, to be married, because you're going to cooperate with God in a tremendous thing, which is to bring children into this world and to get, raise them to get them to heaven. So the epistle for the Mass, of the wedding Mass, is from St. Paul, his letter to the Catholics in Ephesus, chapter 5. And it's mainly an instruction for Jacob and Anna. Listen carefully. Brethren, let wives be subject to their husbands as to the Lord, because a husband is head of the wife, just as Christ is head of the church, being himself the Savior of the body. But just as the church is subject to Christ, so also let wives be to their husbands in all things. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church, and delivered himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, cleansing her in the bath of water by means of the word, in order that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she might be holy and without blemish. Even thus ought husbands also to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh. On the contrary, he nourishes it and cherishes it as Christ also does the church. Because we are members of his body, made from his flesh and from his bones. 
For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, I mean, in reference to Christ and to the church. However, let each one of you also love his wife just as he loves himself, and let his wife respect her husband. The Holy Gospel. Taken from St. Matthew chapter 19. At that time the Pharisees came to Jesus testing him, saying, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for any cause? But he answered and said to them, Have you not read that the Creator from the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this cause a man shall leave his wife, leave his mother, his father and mother, and cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Therefore now they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man put asunder. Thus are the words of the sacred scripture. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. So this is a very happy occasion for all of us, this beautiful marriage between Anna and Jacob. In a time when uh, an, an age, pardon me for bringing up you know, sour news, but this is the age we are in, an age that is killing her babies, an age where infanticide has become a business. And now products are being sold, makeup products, even food products now, with aborted feces, aborted specimens, aborted babies. This is deeply disturbing in our days. How many millions of abortions in the United States alone? Over, six, over 601,000 abortions in one year, 2012, in the United States. So in an age that's trying to kill her babies, in an age where modern man in the name of human rights and my freedom to do what I want and spitting on God's laws are stopping children, doing everything to block children, every means taken to stop the conception of children. This is a grave, grave insult and an abomination before Almighty God. And God, as we read in the Old Testament, as a lesson to all the human race, he killed Onan immediately after practicing birth control. He killed him instantly to teach the human race, as the scripture says, what an abomination this is before God. And we don't need the scriptures to tell us this. We know by reason, we know by nature, we know the way men and women are constructed, the way God built them, that marriage is for children. You don't need a huge manual to, to study this, to figure this out. It's the way God built things. Nature tells us. And God is the author of nature. God is the one who created the earth and the heavens in six days. So children are one of the greatest joys and blessings. And, let's be honest, headaches, many tears, many crosses also because of the fall of Adam and Eve. But the purpose of marriage is children. The first purpose of marriage is children. And, of course, their upbringing. The second end of marriage, as we've studied with Jacob and Anna, the second end of marriage, the purpose, is the love and support of the spouses. And today, since the 1920s and 30s, there was this new thinking that hit Catholic circles and it was a very selfish way of thinking and Pope Pius XI, the great Pope of that time, condemned this idea of marriage. It was called personalism. The idea that marriage is for my own self-career, my own self-fulfillment. So the thinking goes, we'll get married but we won't have children until I have my degree and my career established. So we'll wait five, six, seven years to have our children. If that's how one thinks, don't get married. Because God instituted marriage for children. God wants heaven full. 
And if you get married, that means you accept the joys of marriage, but you also accept the crosses and the tears of marriage. And receiving children from God, taking the children God sends, is a lot of tears. A lot, it's hard work. And raising children to get to heaven, that is tough. It's hard work in an age, especially our age, which is the apostate age. This age has turned its back on God. This age spits at God and insults Him by false ideas and false religions and false beliefs. No, there's only one true God who establishes one true church. Peter, you are rock, and on this rock I will build my church. He didn't say my churches. And our Lord Jesus Christ didn't speak ambiguously. He spoke very clear. The Catholic Church is His bride that He died for. And the Catholic Church men are supposed to be faithful, to defend the faith, to hand it down, to teach it. So this whole new idea of among many errors, but this one error on marriage was affecting already long before Vatican Council II in the 1920s and 30s. So that by Vatican II, the enemies of Christ infiltrated our Catholic Church, hijacked our Catholic Church, and now we have two churches under one pope. And this is a fact. Centuries ago, there would be three popes over one church, the anti-popes. And the church suffered through that. And you had great St. Catherine of Siena and St. Vincent Ferrer, for example, defending the faith at the time. But now we have one pope over two churches. And they, they, they themselves call it the conciliar church. Which is with its new sacraments, its new mass, its new priesthood, its new theology, it's, it's a new religion. And that's why we remain Catholic and stay faithful to tradition. The mass that gave saints, St. Isaac Jogues, tomahawked by the Indians, and brought this mass to convert them, he offered this same exact mass. Father DeSmet, who went up to convert the Indians in Montana, in Wyoming, in Nebraska, and brought many of them to the faith. Whole tribes of Indians were baptized and professed the Catholic faith. And they wanted the black robe. They didn't want Protestant ministers with their wives and children. They wanted the priests who married God and offered the great prayer, the Mass. And this is the exact same Mass. And saying to John Vianney, who would see Christ on the altar, and his face after Mass would shine really bright, because he would see Christ on the altar. St. John Vianney, he offered the same Mass. St. Alphonsus offered the same Mass. St. Thomas de Cori, who was a Franciscan who died in the 1700s, his body lies incorrupt. He never was embalmed. He never had any formaldehyde pumped in his veins. He died in the 1700s, a holy Franciscan old monk. And he's lying there, I got to say Mass once at his altar, and he lies there with a smile. You can still see his little whiskers, his veins in his hands, his fingernails, his toenails, because they were sandals. And he's incorrupt. He's never rotted. And he's, he's not the only one. There's the hundreds of saints who have never rotted because God shows this miracle to show his, to, his, who, to the world who his friends are. And uh, many of his saints, especially the ones who have seen the Virgin Mary, are incorrupt. So these saints, St. Thomas de Cori, would see the, the ch one time the child Jesus appeared on the altar and tapped him on the head. And he would see Christ on the altar, and one time he'd be elevated right off the ground in, in ecstasy, right off the ground at Mass. So was St. Joseph Cupertino. He would elevate right off the ground in love of God and, and ascend high into the church. And everyone would see this amazed, and this would last sometimes for hours. So this is the Mass of saints. This is the Mass that produces saints. Because it's the Mass which... What is the Mass? What is the Mass? If you ask the conciliar church in the new catechism, they'll say the, the Mass is a, is a communal Eucharistic celebration. Sound familiar? The Mass is a uh, Eucharistic communi communal banquet. But that's not the Mass. That's the Protestant definition of the Mass, but that's not the Mass Christ instituted. The Mass Christ instituted is the sacrifice of Christ on the, on the cross 
bloody on the cross, but in the Mass it's unbloody. And that's what the Mass is. The sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross, reenacted on the altar. So this is what Jake and Anna, you're going to make your vows today, and you're going to submit those vows and unite them to the heart of our Lord Jesus Christ in the sacrifice of the Mass. What can be more beautiful, what can be more incredible than to unite your marriage vows to Jesus crucified on the altar, offering His heart to the Father. And that's what the Mass is. It is the greatest possible prayer. Because it's not the prayer of just any man, it's the prayer of Jesus Christ, the Eternal High Priest. And He offers Himself to the Father on the cross. And, and that event of Good Friday, when Christ died on the cross and was crucified for three long hours in agony, bleeding, <clears throat> that is the highest and most perfect prayer. And that's what the Mass reenacts. That's what the Mass is about. That's what you who get married, and us priests who make vows to God, and nuns who make their vows to God, that's what holds our vows together. Because we unite our vows to Jesus crucified. We, we offer ourselves as victims with Him to the glory of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And that's what your marriage vows are about. You unite your marriage and all the sacrifices of marriage and all the children that God will send you and all the sacrifice and raising them correctly. All that's going to be a lot of work. It's going to be a lot of tears. It's going to be a lot of labor. But also many joys and many blessings and much happiness. But unite, unite all that to Jesus crucified to the glory of the Trinity. And during the Mass, twice, the priest is going to turn around and from the Mass for the marriage, he's going to give two big blessings. And the blessings are going to say, they're, long, they're kind of long prayers, but they, they invoke God to bless the couple, and especially the mother, that she receive all the graces to be fruitful in marriage. And taking the children she sends, to be able to see in your old age, this is what the prayer says, may you reach an old age and have the happiness to see your children's children and your, even your great-grandchildren unto the third and fourth generation. And we priests, we, we see of course many, many marriage couples and many, one of the greatest joys of an old couple is when they can say, Father, I have 130 grandchildren and great-grandchildren. And, uh, and, and they're just happy to be able to tell the number of their grandchildren. And that's one of the great joys also. But the greatest joy is, of course, that you get to heaven. And this, will be the, this is going to be your path to heaven, your marriage vows. And the world is going to tell you, look, <clears throat> if you, things get hard and you can't stand each other anymore, dial 1-800 or email 1-800-DIVORCE. And these rotten lawyers who make tons of money on destroying marriages, and now Catholic bishops, these modernist bishops who have no longer believe in the Catholic faith, no longer teach what the Mass really is, no longer warn souls to escape the fires of hell, and they got to obey the commandments to get to heaven. These cowardly bishops who are taking many souls to hell with them, and many novice total priests as well, and the scandals of our own Pope, Pope Francis, it's a grave scandal what he does. And he recently said, uh, it's a, it, Catholics should not seek to convert others to the Catholic religion. And that's, that goes against Christ himself, who ordered the first bishops, you better get out there and preach the Catholic faith. Go and preach to all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. And whoever believes will, and, and is baptized will be saved. Who does not believe will be condemned. How's that for dialogue? If you don't believe the Catholic faith, we will be condemned. That's the way it is. I didn't invent those words. Christ said them. And the Pope is supposed to teach what Christ taught and not change what Christ taught. But this is the terrible times we are in when we even have Popes who turn in, in, in their backs and betray our Lord like St. Peter betrayed his Lord three times. 
So this is the age you got to be faithful. When everyone, the whole world is saying, it's easy to divorce, don't be uh, naive, don't, don't have more than three or four children, how are you going to pay for their education, how are you going to get a new car, how are you going to supply for your uh, old age, that's all arguments of the spirit of the world. And we've got to reject the spirit of the world, which takes many to hell. You're on an adventure now. Anna and Jake, you're, you're setting out on a bigger cruise than anything in the Bahamas or anything into the Pacific. You're in for the biggest adventure of your life. And it's three of you in this adventure. The Blessed Trinity, Jake and Anna. And you're going to cooperate with God to take the children that He wants. And it might be your 15th child that becomes a basketball player that beats the records of Air Jordan. It might be your 12th child that invents the cure for cancer. And we'll see if the pharmacist let him live if he does that. It might be your 20th child. Oh, Father, you're being extreme. St. Catherine was one of 24. She was the 23rd child of 24. This is normal. Large families are normal. Before 1950s, before 1960s, it was normal to have a large family. We have just been so corrupted and so brainwashed by the media that we think now that a big family is, is extreme. That's how sick we have become, twisted in our modern lies that we swim in. So you, uh, Anna and Jacob, you've got to defy the spirit of the world. And uh, you're going to have hard times, but God will give you the grace. And that nuptial blessing that you're going to receive is not just for today. It's going to go to the day you die throughout your whole marriage life. So trust in that grace. And you'll be saints through your marriage life. You're, gonna, you're supposed to become saints by joyfully and patiently bearing with the crosses of, of this life and uh, growing in holiness together together and uh, St. Paul will say it the woman will be saved through childbirth the woman will be saved through taking all the children God sends that's how you'll become a saint why is this? because a big part of being a saint is the continual self-giving to the glory of God and to your neighbor so Jake will always be giving of himself to his family, to his bride, cherishing his bride. And you've got to be willing to die for her and love her. And not just in words, but in all your actions. And then um, <clears throat> the, the self-giving for raising children. It's, it's constant work. The children are sick at night. they got a fever. You're up late with them. You get no sleep. Preparing the meals. Cleaning up diapers. Um, and as the children get older, when they hit their teenage years, that's not always fun either. Because the teenage years, the world draws them. And you've got to teach them and prepare them. And you might have rebellious children. You might have rebellious children, in which case you still must love them. You still must seek their salvation. So trust in that grace of the nuptial blessing. And God will always be there. You have, a, you have all your guardian angels to watch over you. You have the Blessed Mother. You're going to consecrate after your marriage. You're going to go after the Mass and kneel before the statue of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And you're going to consecrate your marriage to her. And she's going to take her all-powerful mantle and she's going to put her mantle over you. And she's going to call you my children. And she's going to look after you. And the devil will always seek to put a wedge between you. The devil is always going to be trying to stir fights and quarrels and distrust. And never let silence build up between you. Never let a day go or not much long before, or certainly not till nighttime, if you knock horns. Do not let silence be built up between you. And that's why be careful of cell phones, computer games, computer gadgets be aware of these things don't let them ruin and get into your life use them as they need to be used just like any instruments even good alcohol and good wine and a good brandy or a good Kentucky bourbon 
These things are good to use. God gave them. There's even blessings for these things in the ritual, wine and good beer. But obviously someone can abuse these, right? By alcoholism, for example. Drunkenness, for example, which can destroy not only a man, but his whole family and, and others. So it is with these gadgets, be careful. I have seen many marriages shaken and even separate because of this stup stupid use of these gadgets. And if the wife is always on him and she has no time to tend to her children, that's a grave negligence before God. And if the husband's always on his phone, doing business on his phone, even in the middle of the meal, and his wife is talking to him, she's got serious things to talk to him about, because little Johnny is acting up, and little, little Susanna is, is, is disobeying, and so forth. You've got to know when to put these gadgets away, and never let them be, build a wedge between you. But a lot of marriages have problems because... They're in the middle of a conversation or a romantic meal and they need this and then suddenly, oh, yeah, Henry, Henry, excuse me, honey, I'll be back in 20 minutes. And the honey is left at the table in the restaurant filing her nails. That should never happen. But yet, this is happening. And so you got to use a lot of common sense and you got to have some manly virtue and strength in you to know all right, there's a time we've got to shut these things off and just have time with God in prayer and time with each other. And you're going to need it, raising children. So, um, anyway, this, we could go on forever and ever on advice and suggestions, but imitate the great saints who have been faithful till death in marriage. And um, first you have the example of Many good people you even know, who are still married, your own parents, who, are, who have never broken their marriage vows. Be faithful like them. And then we have many, many saints who were, became saints through their marriage. Some of them were beautiful marriages and produced saints themselves, like the father of St. Teresa of Lisieux. Their parents are blessed and venerables. And the father of St. Bernard, he is also a blessed and he entered the monastery after his wife died. And, um, <clears throat> and then you have great examples of the early martyrs, St. Timothy and St. Mara. Let me, let me just briefly summarize their life, because this is a good example for all of us. The, this was in the early 300s. It's a true story. It's well recorded, documented. And this is told by St. Alphonsus Liguri. And under the Emperor Diocletian, as you know, he unleashed a terrible persecution on the church. And St. Timothy married a beautiful woman named Mara. And they were happily married. And the persecution broke out. And Timothy um, was denounced by a friend to the emperor. And he was called in to be arrested for being Catholic. And he was asked by Arianus, Arianus was the governor in charge of all this, he said, are you aware of the edicts of the emperor against those who refuse to sacrifice to the gods of Rome? Don't you realize if you don't do this, this could mean death for you? And St. Timothy answered, I'm fully aware of them, and I'd rather lay my life down rather than commit such an act against God, the true God. So then the, um, the governor so told him, if you don't obey, I'm, I will subject you to many tortures. And he refused to obey. And so one of, he went through numerous tortures. Among them, he caused burning irons to be put into his ears until the violence of the pain caused his eyes to start shooting out from his, their sockets. After this terrible torture, St. Timothy began to return thanks to God, and he asked him strength to endure this suffering for the love of him. He suspended, the governor had him suspended on his feet with a, uh, a rock tied to his neck. And so he brought in his wife, Mara, and he, he, he told Mara, tell your husband, sacrifice the incense to the gods, and he'll be set free. 
So what did this girl do? St. Mara, she went to her husband who was hanging upside down. She said, she said these words to him. Timothy, they want you to sacrifice to the gods. And she was moved by tears. And Saint, her husband answered, listen to this, because this, what, what this is the kind of stuff we need of, of men and women today in married couples. He said to his wife, now he's hanging upside down in great pain, how is it possible, my dear Mara, that being yourself Catholic, instead of animating me to die for the faith, you tempt me to abandon it, and thus obtain a short and miserable existence here on earth, and expose myself to the never-ending pains of hell. Is this then how you love me? And Mara, she was a good, girl, a good woman. And the accounts say she was instantly moved to repentance. She was sorry for this. And she fell on her knees and begged our Lord Jesus Christ with tears to forgive her. And then she asked pardon of her husband and told him, Stay strong in the faith. And Timothy also encouraged her. And then the governor, seeing the sudden change of the wife, St. Mara, he threatened her with death. And then he, th he offered her a better husband after her husband was killed. And she refused. And she said, uh, she said she will never abandon the Catholic faith. So this is what he put her through. All right? This is not fiction. This is a real story, a real event. And this is how we have to also love our Lord and love the Holy Faith. Hereupon the governor caused Mara to have her hair violently pulled out and her fingers were cut off. And after this she was lowered in a boiling cauldron of hot water. And when she was lifted out of the water, she was completely untouched, unharmed, miraculously. And then the governor had them both burned with sulfur and pitch all over their bodies. And then they were crucified together on a cross. And they hanged on the cross, facing each other to add to their agony. And St. Alphonsus says, they continued to live on in this state for some days, hanging on the cross. During that time, they, they did not cease to bless the Lord and pray to Him. And they encouraged each other with the hope that they would soon be united to Jesus Christ in heaven. And these two saints, St. Timothy and St. Mara, obtained the crown of their glorious martyrdom on December 19th, at the beginning of the third the 300s. Their festival is kept by the Greek Catholic Church and also by the Muscovites. There was a church at Constantinople built in their honor of these two martyrs. So that's the kind of love you need to have for each other and for, the, for our Lord Jesus Christ. And you're going to be crucified in many ways. One of them is mockery. And mockery, maybe even from your own family and relatives. Oh, uh, why are you having your fifth child? Why are you having your seventh child? Is something wrong? And you've got to put up with this mockery. Mockery from the world. When mom goes shopping in the store and she's got ten children with her, helping her out, the world is going to look at you funny because they've killed all their babies. They've aborted them. They've contracepted them. And you're, you're a prick to their conscience. But when they see joyful children, and especially the, the beauty and joy of a wife that has many children, there's nothing that compares to that. The beauty of a mother with many children, there's just nothing that compares to that except for the joy of a contemplative nun, of a consecrated nun. And I've met many big families, one mother of 17 children, and after Mass, they were there all at Mass, and they were, all, her, all her daughters were surrounding her. And I said, of course, uh, I said to one of the daughters, the older one, I think one of the older ones, I said, well, you must be the mother of all these. She looked older than them all. And the mother who was standing right next to them, 
her, she said, no, oh, thank you, Father, but I'm the mother of them all. <laughs> so you see the youthfulness and the joy and the, and the beauty that God gives to generous mothers. And the, the manliness and the strength that comes with a father that, is, that raises and cherishes such a wife. This is the way it's supposed to be. So keep the laws of God. Keep the Catholic faith. And, and be ready, because you're in for quite a roller coaster ride. You're in for quite an adventure. But happy will you be if you persevere to the end, and because great will be your reward in heaven. So let's continue now with, we're going to go right now to the vows. You're going to make your vows. It's going to be witnessed by Almighty God, by the Virgin Mary, by all the angels and saints, and by those here in this little chapel. And our Lord here in the Blessed Sacrament. And then Mass will continue, and when the bells ring, I don't know if you're all Catholic, if you're not Catholic, um, you can't come to communion because you must profess the Catholic faith to receive the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. But when, when, if you're not Catholic or if you're not Vistordo, remember that when we hear the bells ring and the priest raises the consecrated host in chalice, that's the event of the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. That's when it's really taking place on the altar. And at that moment, you'll hear the bells ring. Everyone is on their knees. Even all the angels fall down in adoration before God. Millions of angels that surround the, the altar at Mass. Even the devils howl and scream. Even hell feels the power of the Mass. So on this great day, you're going to unite your vows with Jesus crucified. And remember, that's the true secret of true love. Self-sacrifice and Jesus crucified. And we glory in Jesus crucified. Because that is the great proof of the love of the sacred heart of Jesus. O Mary conceived without sin. O Mary conceived without sin. O Mary conceived without sin. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen.